<clears throat> Hello. Um, so uh, today is um, the 26th of uh, April 2022, and we'll talk about three important architects: I am paid, I am paid, uh, Peter Zumthor, and uh, Frederick uh, Law Olmsted, the important <clears throat> North American landscape architect. I will begin with I am paid. What, what is going on here? Uh, anyway, sorry for the uh, for the absence of an introductory text, and I am actually alarmed. I hope there is one a little bit later. No, so I have to to count on my uh, my own. Um, this is uh, I, I I didn't begin uh, auspiciously now, and I, I apologize. I should have added, I added one uh, text from Wikipedia for, um, for uh, Peter Zumthor, but not for, for um, uh, IMP. Anyway, IMP was an architect um, who was born in China in an affluent family. And, um, you know, he, he came to the United States, I don't know exactly at what age, before the college years. And he, um, he studied for a while at MIT. Then I think he went to, uh, to Harvard, um, he was promoting modernity from the very beginning. Uh, he received the Pritzker Prize, as you know, and um, he was indeed a, a force in uh, North American architecture with a large uh, office and with uh, many accomplishments. So I, I will begin with showing some, um, some um, uh, pictures, uh, you know, kind of an ad memoir about um, IMP, uh, always smiling, <laughs> almost irritatingly, irritatingly so, because <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, uh, life has problems, as you know, we all have problems. Why is this my, a man smiling all the time, you know? <laughs> I mean, I know, I know, uh, but no, it's not true. You know, not all Chinese smile like this. My, on the other hand, not all Chinese uh, had the success IMP had. He lived a very, very long life. Um, you know, he, he had a beautiful wife and uh, he had uh, great commissions and he built a lot and uh, everything worked for this man. Um, anyway, so I guess in his place, anyone would smile. Uh, anyway, I, as I said, I just go through a few pictures in a rather, you know, aleatory way. Here he is, of course, uh, with the glass pyramid behind him, uh, and then the Louvre and the sky, uh, smiling again. Yes, you did it, Mr. Pei. It's true, you did it. <laughs> Irritatingly so, almost. I like him more as a young man, you know. He's uh, not yet smiling. And uh, he was, uh, without doubt, a very interesting man. And, uh, you know, the fact that he left MIT which now I think is considered the best architecture school in the world and not just architecture, or anyway, it's one of the best. In some years it is considered the best, but then, you know, he went to Harvard, which is not doing, uh, you know, uh, a much worse job at all. Uh, <laughs> yes, we know, we know you, you, you can smile, Mr. Um, Mr. Pei. So let's look at his first project. 1949. So this is this was before the, I mean, uh, just uh, just uh, three years after after the Second World War. Um, Ponce de Leon. Actually, there is the the dean at uh, at uh, Princeton. Her name is uh, Ponce de Leon, but this is the name of an avenue. Uh, I, I was referring to an architect from Venezuela, uh, uh, married to. Uh, Nader Tehrani, a very important architect himself and Dean of uh, Cooper Union. But this is about an avenue in Atlanta, 1959. Please be kind and turn off the microphone if you are so kind. So, you know, unless you want to say something. You see at the beginning, IMP did, uh, you know, whatever came to him, you know, that it was after the war. It was, um, he didn't yet become the star that he became. Uh, Louis Kahn also uh, started very modestly. And most architects, if you see the first buildings by Frank Gehry, you won't believe they were done by Frank Gehry. 
they arrived at uh, that uh, you know flowering so to speak neurotical or otherwise uh, referring to Frank Gehry, but at the beginning they did uh, you know almost conventional buildings like here uh, the mesa now now all of a sudden we see something else the mesa laboratory of the national center for atmospheric research it's already a sculptural work a powerful work uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, volumetric interest and uh, it is cultural, it has vigor. I like this work. Uh, I don't know when it was built, but uh, I think in the 50s. And it stands out still because of the vigor of the volumes, the, the you know, the sculpturalness of the building. Dormitories, a new college in Florida. So now we go uh, approximately chronologically uh, through his oeuvre, through his works. These are early works, dormitories, a new college in Florida, IMP. I like this work too. You know, it's, it has the labyrinthical quality of some of the, the villages in China, I think, uh, you know, uh, because he, he was born there and he grew up in China. Um, you know, uh, something of China was with him all the time. Maybe in later years, some, some, some of those roots became less obvious. We'll see a, a work by him done in China later in his life when he returns, so to speak, to China. But this work, I think, in, uh, in Florida, the new college, the dormitories, I, I personally like it. I, I, I like the, 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 those um, uh, you know, narrow spaces, as someone uh, called them in Romanian, spazi gratuite. Well, uh, we have kind of something like this. It's very possible that, uh, you know, certain proximities here would uh, make uh, some people uncomfortable. But considering it, it was a community for students, it is a community for students, I, I guess it works. I personally like this work, although indeed, there might be here functional problems also in terms of light and sunlight, but it worked. It worked for IMP. Uh, <laughs> when we look at the actual pictures, uh, we don't see that density and those narrow corridors, we see sunlight, but maybe it's just this picture that uh, shows a much more airy, uh, uh, you know, uh, architecture, architectural uh, reality. Now the famous John F. Kennedy Library, uh, he indeed received, uh, he was uh, spoiled uh, with uh, incredible commissions. I mean, think just about this, the John F. Kennedy Library. And it is, uh, it's still a, a work which I admire for its uh, freshness, for its um, uh, modern, mo modern impetus. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, yes, there is a lot of glass. Yes, you, you can tell this is a building that, um, you know, proclaims, um, you know, in a certain way, uh, authority and, uh, you know, almost governmental. Now, of course, we know it's the governmental library. Uh, you know, it could have been anything else, or actually, you know, but it's probably impressive you know, entering this space uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, ignoring the, the bill, the electrical bill, because here you would suffocate in the summer and, uh, and, and freeze in the winter because of so much glass. But uh, it, it's probably impressive. Uh, the, the geometry that IMP uses is very often very simple. Uh, you know, a circle, a triangle, a square, rotated or not. I think it's a good building. And uh, strangely, perhaps, some of the, of the later presidential libraries, in my opinion, are not as creative as, uh, and as fresh as this one done by IMP. Um, Now he, that's how he worked for all kinds of large uh, commissions, you know, like the convention center in New York City, 
uh, he was, um, I mean, his office was a master uh, in, uh, in uh, manipulating large uh, surfaces of glass with a convincing uh, steel structure, exactly what he did actually with the glass pyramid in Paris. Now, this is, uh, of course, the, the opening of the, of the library, but a sad event because of the, of the death of uh, um, uh, JFK. Uh, here is uh, another Kennedy, his brother, and uh, here is President Carter. I guess the, the, the library came into being uh, under President Carter. All in all, of course, it's a moment that re remembers here is the wife, uh, Jacqueline Onassis, uh, the, the, the wife of JFK. Um, it, 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 you can tell from their faces that it was not really a moment of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, totally, total uh, joy and lightness, because yes, it was a tragic event in the life of uh, the United States. Uh, and uh, the, the, the murder of the president. Um, the building is accomplished, I think. And, and he has all the reasons to smile again here. Um, yeah. So the presidential Kennedy Library built by IMP. Uh, you'll see that the other buildings he built uh, very very different in terms of function that is the rock and roll uh, hall of fame i think that's how it is called is not very different from from the presidential library so the narrative uh, is uh, although they are very different uh, the functions of the buildings uh, you know they they don't look so very different now what is this this is a uh, this is a less known work is a is a is a um, um, like a park. It's a park. Um, let's see where it is. Uh, Provi Providence Cathedral Square, modeled after the Greek Agora marketplace. Uh, let's only hope that indeed, like in the Agora of ancient times, um, you know, philosopher met here and uh, disputed uh, great ideas. But I don't think this is happening because, uh, you know, this is not Hyde Park and this is not, uh, you know, this is a city where uh, on, on all sides of the park or of the square, uh, countless cars drive incessantly and uh, <laughs> the so-called Agora, as you can see, is empty. Uh, anyway. Actually, even this work, I don't think is so bad from, from the little I can see, we can see from, from this picture. He didn't do the cathedral, let's, um, let's say it, but he did the park in front of it. And I, I, I like the fact that it's not, it's not symmetrical, or is it? It might actually be, uh, but uh, from this angle, it doesn't seem to be alarmingly symmetrical. Is not rigid and the, and the, and the, and the trees uh, animate the space. I, I would say rather rather pleasantly. Yeah, I think it is symmetrical. Uh, anyway, but there's, there is a, a feeling of, of being open and void, and yes, somehow needing to 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 receive um, you know participants to some unknown activity. A penthouse, a Lamar building, 1976. Um, penthouse, Lamar building, 1976. I guess he only did the top here, the penthouse. Uh, I remember a project by Tadao Ando also kind of in this period. Well, not so uh, alarmingly big, but still, um, you know, with a lot of glass and so on, with some acrobatics uh, at the top. Uh, Dallas City Hall, IMP. Again, a, a work with uh, with courage, um, you know. Uh, uh, when you think that it's a governmental building, you, normally you think about federal buildings or governmental buildings as being rather conformist. Well, you see, it's not conformist. It has it has uh, it has uh, this geometrical vigor, which which I, I think we 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 could easily appreciate. 
what does what does such a building tell you if you have business to do in this building it's probably a, a refreshing feeling you get because the building doesn't communicate stiffness or boredom or you know excessive bureaucracy but rather you know uh, the vigor of efficiency and uh, correctness and so on which is important i think it's very important i like this building too or uh, today probably we don't have any longer this kind of belief in institutions and uh, this kind of belief in this kind of uh, you know uh, uncompromising modernity the john hancock tower in boston uh, and the tower it is, I understood some years ago, there were problems, they had to change the windows or, yeah, I think for the whole tower. Um, well, problems uh, exist always, but it's an important tower in Boston and uh, it was designed by IMP uh, Fried and, and Cobb, uh, I don't know if exactly, because he had two other partners plus associates and, and sub partners and so on a big a big firm it became a big firm everson museum I, I like it again you know it's it's cryptical it's monumental it's uh, it's doing its job it is uh, protecting the artworks after all a museum essentially conceptually is nothing else but you know a box a, a, a storage a cultural storage not bad. Now we arrive at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which I mentioned, and which is, uh, well, not identical with the um, Kennedy Library, but uh, the, the architectural language is not very different. As you can see, like just, in fact, you can see the, the Louvre Pyramid right here, you know, in the United States, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, lots of glass, uh, giant uh, triangle, uh, maybe two, uh, and then, uh, you know, some um, uh, other things, uh, but uh, all in all, it's, it's not a bad building. It's, it's, I don't know. I mean, in a way it is simplistic, but it's executed well. It's, it's, it's convincing uh, because it is, it doesn't show too many uh, Hamletian dilemmas or, uh, you know, unnecessary doubting. It worked. Uh, now, does it represent the spirit of rock and roll? Well, maybe to an extent because of uh, some, uh, you know, uh, adventurous architectonic gestures. But again, when you, I mean, what does rock and roll have in common with the Kennedy Library? One is about knowledge and the other one is about, uh, you know, almost anti-knowledge. I mean, I love rock and roll. It's true. It, it has energy. It has. Uh, I think we need uh, we need rock and roll in our lives. In fact, I think we need a rock and roll architecture. Is this a rock and roll architecture? Only partially, but I think it's okay. It is okay. And the rock and rollers had uh, enough money, uh, so there was no problem for IMP to build whatever he wanted. Again, if you look at the plan, what do you do? You see some uh, a derivation from the triangle, a square. Uh, this is actually almost half of a square. So a triangle, which is half of a square, a circle. Things are not too complicated. He works with basic uh, geometries. Uh, sit situated uh, impeccably uh, and so on. And inside, uh, of course, here they are. Ray Charles, let me see if I recognize them. John Lennon, I, I see Tina Turner. I don't know who those three people are, but um, anyway, I love rock and roll. In fact, if my laptop would have allowed me to play music while we, we have uh, Zoom presentations, I think you'd have uh, listened to a lot of music. But I know when I play Zoom and uh, YouTube, um, it doesn't work. Anyway. Again, uh, sloping uh, glass surfaces, giant, and underneath those who can pay the bills. But that, at that time, there was no concern for, uh, you know, uh, 
the climate change and sustainability. Society Hill Towers in Philadelphia, housing, I like them. Uh, you know, they are, they are simple, they are uh, sincere, they are, uh, they are strong. Uh, there is a certain level of lack of glamour, which is actually a quality, I, I, I think. Are they domestic? Well, not in the sweet sense of the word, not in the sense of you know gingerbread house, uh, but uh, he also built uh, kind of similar towers in uh, New York City, and I hope we see them. Uh, what can we say? These are not for for proletarians. You know, they are expensive uh, apartments. You know, proletarians cannot uh, afford, afford um, you know uh, designers like I am paying. It's interesting that, uh, for example, uh, uh, I mean, you know, with with a, with a greed and nothing but a greed, uh, he actually is able to create an architecture that is not uh, uh, disappointing. The inside better uh, better move forward. What can we say? He's not responsible for the furnishings. He is more responsible with what you see here. Um, yeah, large spaces, of course, a lot of air conditioning going in because, uh, you know, what can you do? The silver towers in New York, these are the towers that I, I refer to, um, not very different from what we saw in Philadelphia with a sculptural work by Picasso because Picasso did everything in art. Uh, absolutely everything, even Rose Theatre, I don't know if you know. I mean, Picasso was, uh, was something else, so to speak. Um, and he also lived a long life, just like, um, just like uh, I am paid. There are people who live a lot, you know. Like uh, yesterday, uh, a friend of mine who is actually here now told us that, um, you know, Peter Eisenman is planning to even build something later on after he teaches a little more and he's almost 90. So Picasso in the front and, uh, and uh, IMP in the back. Gateway, Gateway East, Singapore. I don't insist too much on, 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 on this because we have a lot to see. Uh, after after IMP will follow uh, Peter Zumthor and then uh, Olmsted if, you if you'll still be here. Unfortunately, in my opinion, in the 80s and 90s, IMP became maybe because there were too many commissions and, you know, uh, he couldn't handle all of them. So there were important partners there like Creed and uh, um, Harry Cobb. Uh, and and, and they, they became the authors, actually, of some of the buildings of the larger office. So it, was, it wasn't just him. You know, office buildings, corporate buildings, uh, correctly built, but nothing really very special or, uh, you know, uh, very, very uh, creative even. You see, Pay, Cobb and Free, they, this was the name of the firm, but they had many other people with them, of course. The Four Seasons Hotel, uh, already here we see postmodernism. I, I don't know if uh, Free or um, Harry Cobb had um, you know uh, a significant saying in this particular building. They were both good good architects, and they they had their own individuality. I don't know if I am pay by himself would have designed this building in this way. Maybe he would have. Uh, after all, his name was still uh, there at the top of the uh, the farm. But here we see we see the influence of postmodernism. Still, not in a not in a very bothering way, I would say. So there is still the same, uh, you know, uh, vigor that characterized earlier works by him. <coughs> he he didn't really. I mean, yes, at the entrance here, I think it's lamentable. But uh, what can you do at that time? Even. Uh, uh, architects in Japan, uh, the sophisticated Japan uh, collapsed under the weight of postmodernism. What's going on here is uh, the compromise with postmodernism. And to me is, uh, is uh, you know, questionable, but 
It was done. What can we do? L'Enfant Plaza a hotel. Now this is more like uh, like uh, I am pay. Uh, you see here the pyramid that uh, later was built at the Louvre was built here. Where was it? Uh, I don't say uh, it's not written, unfortunately. So you know the the pyramid was not unique that he planted in front of the Louvre. It is planted here in front of this building also. He designed both. Um, so. Unfortunately, as I said, in the in the 80s and the 90s, he maybe in a way it's explainable because of the large quantity of commissions. You know, some of these buildings are not, you know, uh, immensely creative. We have to face it. The 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 pyramid is a pyramid, the glass pyramid. What I mean, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> I mean, you know, if behind it would have been the Louvre, you would have said this is the glass pyramid of the Louvre. Well, it's not the Louvre, and what is here is not the Louvre. It's okay. The pyramid in Paris, since we talked about it, everybody knows see there is no tourist who goes to Paris and doesn't uh, immediately rush to see the pyramid. Here he is, triumphant in a rather, you know, infantile way, if I am allowed to be malicious. Sorry, uh, but um, anyway, I used to bike around this uh, this pyramid. Uh, um, yeah, personally, I have some problems. If you allow me to to express my subjectivity about this, because I, I yes, maybe I'm a conformist, but for me, a pyramid should be cryptical and opaque, like they are in Egypt. A transparent pyramid to me is uh, problematic. Although I used one myself, I made one myself, and in fact, before I am pay, but mine remained on paper, I think in 1980 or so. Anyway, um, maybe one day I'll show you that project. I have been here. It's it's okay, but uh, we already know, uh, based on what we saw earlier, that the, the large triangles of glass. They are not a novelty in his work. We have seen them at the, uh, you know, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We have seen a lots of glass at the Kennedy Library. Um, personally, when I went inside here, I felt kind of like in an airport. If you didn't see the old buildings, you could have easily said, uh, "Yeah, I'm a, I, I'm on an airport." Uh, but but it's executed impeccably. Um, the rotation brings in some 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 dynamic uh, quality. Uh, I personally think the work is a little bit um, over appreciated. But this is a <laughs> this is a you see. Uh, consciously or unconsciously, there was a reaction against the glass pyramid. And what we look look at in this picture is a, is a work by a, an artist, I forgot his name, who did this temporary artwork, this trompe l'oeil, that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, problematizes the pyramid. You don't know any longer what's going on here. It's actually done with, uh, with, uh, with prints with uh, with uh, you know paperwork uh, you see it here it didn't last for long for long because the wind was blowing these things but when it when it started it was impressive you didn't know what was going on anyway this was not done by imp uh, what can we say we miss those times before the pandemic when uh, scenes like these were very common the in, in, in front of, uh, of, uh, of the Louvre. Um, you know, the, the reason I have some problems with this pyramid of glass are the same with the, with the, with the, with the doubts I have about the Reichstag dome, also in glass by Sir Norman Foster. It's very interesting that for two authoritarian buildings, the Reichstag and the Louvre, two modern architects chose 
uh, you know, uh, glass architecture. In the case of the French, of the of Paris, uh, the glass pyramid. In the case of Berlin, a glass dome. Uh, I understand that they both wanted to express some kind of a democratic uh, revenge on uh, the author authoritarian uh, dimensions of the, the older buildings. But uh, um, I don't know. I am not against oxymorons or paradoxes, but I, I'm not truly really convinced. And I understood there were some, some, uh, some, uh, some, there was criticism against this work, but I, by I am paid. Anyway, it was done. And, but I do like this part. I like that the, the pyramid, uh, there is this uh, smaller pyramid inside that po points downwards. This part of his intervention there, I like. Maybe because it's it's about um, you know uh, uh, in this case the pyramid is reversed and thus it um, it opposes further uh, you know the centrality of power. But. Otherwise, in, in you know, in many respects, this uh, you know very very busy. Um, I almost said the airport. This very easy, very busy museum. A resemblance here and there. You know, a large um, a large uh, supermarket or a mall. What can we do? The democratization of culture. Uh, you know the the view from the top. Uh, another view of that. Um, I don't know exactly when this photograph was taken of that uh, subversive work of that artist. Yes, Miss. <laughs> yes, yes. He's like a kid here, you know, pointing uh, towards his work um, with uh, an obviousness which is a, a little bit um, provocative for me. But anyway, Bank of China, another important work by him. Uh, no, the truth is, uh, he, he was an architect of, of uh, ability to, to handle uh, large uh, programs with a spectacular structure sometimes, uh, and a uh, master of, uh, of, uh, of employing, uh, you know, triangles. I mean, look, it's impeccable what we see here, you know, I mean, it, the execution is impeccable. The design, I'm sure, was impeccable too. Now, that these people might risk their lives here, it's possible. But um, anyway, you are, you realize the immensity of the of the building when you contemplate the fragility and the scale of the human beings. You know, uh, almost uh, difficult to see. And this is just a detail of the building. It's huge, but. It's a bank. So if banks are not huge, then what? Because we don't build any longer cathedrals in this, in this way. So the bank is the new cathedral. The bottom here to me is a little bit uh, problematic because uh, it has almost nothing to do with the rest of the building. You know, it's, it's a base, it's a platform, but uh, rather you know, conformist and almost historicist. Uh, you don't see it uh, from most, um, you know, angles. Uh, you just see the silhouette, and the silhouette is impressive because of these triangles which uh, animate the building. Glass, glass, and again glass, uh, as uh, somebody called them, uh, Andrea Kahn, uh, an architect and theoretician in the United States. She talked about the demagogy of glass. Indeed, uh, glass can be and is very often demagogical because it gives you the illusion that through transparency, you can access everything, everything that you see. But uh, it's an illusion because you are still separated. And sometimes very much so because you can't even open a door. Do you think that any door, any window here opens? No way. So yes, there is transparency. The eye sees far, far away, but the eye, what about the other senses? 
this is certainly not a sustainable building. This is for sure. And most skyscrapers are not, if not all of them. So when I hear Sir Norman Foster talk about sustainability, I, I feel like uh, having a bitter smile because it's, 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 it's demagogy. You know, most buildings by, uh, if not all the buildings by Sir Norman Foster require a huge amount of technology to compensate for the modernism of uh, the glass and steel structures that he uses. Again, the plan, of course, it is, you know, conceptually, the building is not so difficult to comp comprehend. It's a clear scheme. Uh, the diagonals take care of the need for, uh, you know, some kind of a spectacle. And there is the purity of the square, the purity of the triangle, and uh, everything works. And with the money of, uh, of a huge bank, everything works. Now we arrive at the Miho Museum. Uh, this is a museum, I think, in Japan. Um, a different context now because uh, he's not any longer in the United States. Um, I like this work, and he built another one in China. We are going to see it too. He doesn't make, you know, uh, fatal mistakes because he he perfected an architectural language, which is. Uh, uh, convincing uh, for almost all uh, programs. But it is, a, in my opinion, it is a little bit uh, predictable. And uh, in terms of its level of uh, poetry, I don't know. I mean, did he achieve here the, the, the balance, the, 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 the harmony between uh, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of fineness? Sometimes maybe, but... Most of the time, I think, you know, IMP was a good architect, but he himself recognized when the son, the illegitimate son of Louis Kahn visited him for the film he made, My Architect, he did recognize that Kahn was a great architect because he was a greater artist. Uh, there was an artistic side in, uh, in uh, IMP as well, but, um, I think I am, I am paid just like Philip Johnson understood that uh, uh, Louis Kahn was, uh, was uh, you know, more, uh, more intense, somehow less commercial, uh, in a way more complex. And, and I appreciate the fact that the man of, of I am paid stature recognized this fact. This, this says something about his character in, in, a, uh, in, in a positive way. Yes, there is a certain level of mundanity in his work, uh, you know, or, or a, a, com a certain commercialism, but it's, it's not uh, bothering. It's not bothering. And, and again, you know, because of his manipulations of triangles, in this case, uh, this roofing, he's, he's able to animate a space uh, in interesting ways. Lewis Memorial Chapel. <clears throat> yes, he lets you how it looks outside. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if he had in mind the uh, St. Mary Cathedral by uh, Mary Cathedral by, uh, well, St. Mary Cathedral by Kenzo Tange in, uh, in, in Tokyo. I, I have a feeling he did. But he created something which belongs to him, but there are some. Um, you know, echoes, so to speak, from Tange. A religious work done in a, in a language which, um, yes, it's through and through modern. Now, the National Gallery of Art in Washington, this is one of the, his best works, in my opinion. I like it more than most other works by him. Yes, the interior is kind of predictable. You know, escalators, uh, glass handrails, uh, steel and glass, uh, you know, roofing. Uh, but uh, the, the plan of the building uh, has a dynamic quality because of two triangles 
interlocked and opposing each other. And it is the dialectics between the triangles uh, makes it uh, uh, you know, additionally dynamic. We already saw that play with the triangles at the Louvre, where there was um, you know, the big pyramid outside and then a smaller pyramid inside pointing downwards. Uh, some sketches by, uh, by IMP. Uh, and here is the building and uh, it's refreshing to see here, you know, the White House and to see here the, this building. And I'm very happy that, uh, you know, the North Americans welcomed, you know, a vigorous modernity not far away from the center of power. But this is dedicated to art. And so maybe <clears throat> the otherness of art uh, obliged to this. I like the plans of this building, as you can see them here, you know, abstract, astute, uh, clean, uh, uh, dynamic. Uh, so there is a, a balance, I would say, here between being and becoming. They are, they are stable and unstable at the same time. So this is, this is the, the, the plan of this building. Uh, I think there is, I personally like more the, the, the bidimensionality of the drawings than the, because here, I think he could have done more, but I think IMP often he was unable to completely eliminate a certain level of modernity <clears throat> or commercialism. And this is this can be seen even here. This could have been, I'm sorry, Mr. I am paying, but this could have been a mall too. Um, yes, there is Alexander Calder here suspended from the ceiling. Uh, you know, uh, artists are always uh, improving, well, not always, sometimes improving what the architect was uh, unable to achieve uh, properly. But here we see, you know, his building compared to the you know, uh, rigid, uh, you know, uh, architecture of, uh, uh, you know, uh, an absent modernity. Yes, I like it, especially seen from above or in the plants. I think inside uh, the building could have been a little bit, uh, a little bit better, but it's probably very popular exactly because it's not a little bit better. Again, you know, we see some kind of a pyramid of glass here. He, he had some, uh, you know, signature elements that he repeated in various, uh, in various um, configurations or uh, occasions. The underground emerging. The Deutsches Historisches Museum in Berlin. Uh, I passed by this building, I didn't enter it. Uh, it's not bad, it's just that this, uh, you know, uh, excessive uh, uh, trust in glass, in my opinion, and, and I'm not talking about, uh, you know, sustainability or the climate change, although I should, but there is here again, I, I, I cannot avoid the words of um, Andrea Kahn, the demagogy of glass. You know, it's, it becomes so very easy, no? Uh, you just, uh, where, wherever you have uh, walls, instead of having walls, you just put glass and then you have the steel structure. But Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, I think correctly said that the, uh, you know, it's, 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 it might not be anything difficult with making architecture if there wasn't um, the need for windows, but, but Frank Lloyd Wright referred to a different kind of uh, conception about windows. In the case of IMP, he had no problems. You know, he just uh, traced a few lines, uh, structural lines, and then everything else, you know, covered with glass, uh, without discrimination in a way. Uh, it works, but again, the, the, the uh, it's, it's, it's a little simplistic in my opinion. And again, who pays the bills here uh, to, to, you know, to create a, a, an acceptable level of temperature inside and humidity is probably a little bit furious at Mr. Um, IMP. But now I, 
I'm thinking in, I, I'm talking in uh, righteous terms, you know, uh, opportunistically uh, not forgetting uh, the time we live in, that is um, climate change and, uh, and so on. Glass, glass, and again glass. Try to imagine how it is here in the summer if there was no air condition. Uh, it would melt down. But <laughs> fortunately, the Germans has, uh, have a strong economy, so I guess uh, they can afford some air conditioning. Um, yeah. I don't know why modernity thinks that only with glass, a lot of glass, it can assert itself. Uh, here, you know, we see a circle which could have been if it wasn't so mundane uh, in, in some work by Kant, but uh, he was aware, he knew, he knew, he was a good architect, but he knew he was a little bit less good than uh, Louis Kahn. Anyway, uh, we arrived at the museum in China. Uh, finally, he's back to his uh, native country. And I, I am sure it was an emotional encounter to build there. I don't know if he built any other building besides this. It's a museum. Um, he tried to, to connect in a way with the, with, the, with the culture of the place. When I say it's almost inappropriate to call China a place because it's a you know, a sum of almost uh, infinite number of places. It's a huge country. He, he is at his best, as I said, when he uh, manipulated triangles and, uh, you know, surfaces, and, you know, uh, he, always, he, always, he always did good things in this way. But the building still is a little bit, uh, in my opinion, a little bit, uh, uh, predictable um, is the symbolism of the hexagon in China. I don't know. He works with rotations, as you can see, various rotations, and the space underneath uh, benefits from these rotations. Rotations usually uh, activate a space. So when you have troubles with a building that is too static, begin to rotate some floors if, if possible and things will be kind of solved. Um, it's okay, I would say. I mean, uh, I'm not a good evaluator, but uh, I don't know. Uh, as you can see, uh, he, he wasn't very at ease to use uh, organic materials. You know, he didn't use uh, brick. Uh, these stones are, uh, you know, carefully, uh, you know, uh, distinct from the building. The building has uh, impeccable white walls. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's a little bit septic for my taste, but uh, I am subjective myself, so. Water, uh, China is very good at this. You know, they bring water near many of their buildings. They surrounded a building by Alvaro Cesar. They, 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 they are very, very appreciative of water, and uh, I think this helps, if for nothing else but the reflections in the water. But I like the fact that the building is not monolithic, it's, it's approximating somehow the, the village atmosphere of those. I, I, I keep saying all the time, I love, I never travel to China, but I have a beautiful book from 1928, a German book on Chinese architecture and landscape. And I saw beautiful pictures of old, old uh, villages. So I think China, if it explores uh, the rural culture that it has, could, uh, could actually uh, provoke even, uh, generate even a, a, some kind of a revolution in architecture if the word revolution is not too ambitious, and probably is. Again, the roof, the roof, the roof, the ceiling, they, 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 they uh, animate the building and uh, right, right, rightly so, because the roof is the transition between the building and the sky. And, and both in China and Japan, the roof is, uh, if I'm referring to the, uh, the traditional architecture, is very important. The Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, in Qatar, 
this one to me is a little bit literal, uh, a little bit mimicking, uh, you know, conveniently the so-called local culture. Uh, I find it a little bit sterile. And again, he's too accommodating. The level of abstraction he arrived at, in my opinion, is not sufficient. But rotations, rotations, rotations do exist in the stalactites and stalagmites of, uh, you know, uh, the Arab world and the Islamic world. But here they are a little bit um, you know, predictable and simplistic, I would say. And then he has this, uh, you know, his windows are, are, are a little bit uh, cosmetic or uh, they are not very convincing. They are not truly felt, I think. Anyway, he built it. I know to speak about these uh, windows here, which again are, are uh, too convenient, you know, too literal and too, too uncreative, I think. Uh, he built it. And this kind of stair, you know, it's, it's, it's the stair of authority and power and symmetry. Uh, and convention, essentially. Yeah. And here we see other symbols of that. Doha, I am paid. Okay, uh, let's wish him happy birthday. And now we go to uh, another architect of importance that is Peter Zuntor. And uh, let's hope, uh, um, let's hope I will not be carried away by excessive uh, subjectivity, I will try to be as object, objective as possible. Uh, sorry about, uh, I have a presentation with, uh, I, I was afraid this would happen. Um, God, and how do I do this? It, it, it doesn't become smaller, I, I, I'm lost. I have a presentation with Studio Fuchsash and Peter Zumtor, and I should not have opened. I should not have. Okay, fortunately, I was uh, sorry about this. We'll go to to Peter Zumtor. Uh, I have a double presentation which I made um, a while ago, and uh, I, I was supposed to open it here, but uh, I forgot from Karen's. Okay, Peter Zumtor. Uh, let's read a little bit about him. So Peter Zumtor. Uh, was born, as you can see, on April 26, 1943. He's a Swiss architect whose work is frequently described as uncompromising and minimalist. Though managing a relatively small firm, he is the winner of the 2009 Pritzker Prize and 2013 Riba Royal Gold Medal. Um, Anyway, we'll, 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 we'll talk about, uh, about his, uh, his works. Yes, I, I did want to say that, you know, managing a relatively small firm, but I never saw a picture with his firm. I never saw a picture with him and his, um, uh, you know, uh, colleagues of work with his employees. He always, always, always pictures himself alone. You think that this man does all the works by himself. You know, with one uh, one leg, uh, one foot on a on a, on a chair, maybe with a cigar in his uh, in his mouth, uh, uh, drawing. But the truth is, he has um, you know uh, associates, and uh, he, he could not have built those buildings alone. But they are never shown. Never. We do not see the small firm. Small, if it is small. Even here, it says relatively small. This says something about him. Uh, so let's uh, let's read further about Peter Zumtor. Was born in Basel, Switzerland. His father was a cabinet maker, which exposed him to design from an early age and led him to become an apprentice for a carpenter later in 1958. He studied at the, the Arts and Crafts School in his na na native city, starting in 1963. Uh, in 1966, Zumthor studied industrial design and architecture as an exchange student at Pratt Institute in New York. In 1968, uh, he became conservationist architect for the Department uh, for the Preservation of Monuments uh, at the, of the Cant Canton of Graubünden. 
uh, this work on historic restoration uh, projects gave him a further understanding of construction and the qualities of different rustic building materials. As his practice developed, Tsumtor was able to incorporate his knowledge of materials into modernist uh, construction and detail. Detailing. His buildings explore the tactile and sensory qualities of spaces and materials while retaining a minimalist feel. Um, let's hope I can, yeah, okay, just a second. So this, this is the map. We all know him. He's considered by some uh, as being a mystic. I personally have some doubts about his mysticism. Uh, in fact, I found an article uh, and actually several on the web where some people comment on his uh, hunger for publicity, which normally under normal conditions, a true mystic does not have, does not entertain. Uh, here he is again. Um, it's very interesting how this man was able to uh, you know, depict himself in, in, in these um, rather romantic ways. Um, although, I mean, yes, I am subjective, but when I look at his face, <laughs> I would not think of a mystic. I would not think of a mystic at all. Uh, in fact, in comparison, I, I would almost say that I am Pei, especially when he was young, looked more like a mystic than uh, uh, than uh, Tsumtor in this picture. Now it's true, this is one picture, but but this picture says a lot about him. I think this man is a shrewd man. I mean, that's what I see on his face, and. Uh, Maybe I'm also influenced by what I read, but I don't need to be influenced by what I read. I can, I can see. I have eyes to see. Anyway, uh, I have some doubts about him, and I will, I will try to comment on his works. I, didn't I tell you? Here he is. You know, you say that this man works alone, but he doesn't work alone. He has an office, relatively small. You know what that means you know, at least 10, 15 people. Uh, and why is it that they are never shown? This building, I think, personally, I think uh, Peter Zumthor is relevant and uh, appreciated, is relevant to the people who still be believe uh, unquestionably in, in reason, in, uh, in uh, the clarity of reason, in uh, rectangular forms. After all, what, what else do we see here? You know, it's a rectangularity almost, almost at its best. I mean, the, the rhythm itself and the long straight lines and so on, it's really, it's really a, 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 an architecture of, uh, of, of reason. That's why I'm a little bit surprised when I read when, or when I hear that he's considered a mystic. The Zinc Mine Museum in Sauda in, uh, uh, I think it's in, in, uh, in, in Norway, um, troubles me further, and I will try to say why. Uh, I think the architecture is, <clears throat> is, uh, is um, rather ominous, not just because of the blackness <clears throat> of, these, of its enclosures, but if I didn't know this was made by Peter Zumthor, if I just saw this picture, I would, I would imagine actually, I, I, I would not be surprised if behind this, uh, in case I was able to see, if I saw, uh, you know, uh, 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 a military man with a big rifle, you know, uh, uh, controlling, uh, you know, the, the, the space around this structure, uh, let's say if this was part of a, uh, of a prison or a camp, it's something uh, militaristic about it. This is what I feel, you know, it's very similar, these two, uh, I don't know how they are called, these cabins from where, you know, a uh, uh, keeper of uh, order in a prison or a camp, uh, you know, watches everything. I would never think of this building as belonging to the architecture of a mystic. But there is something else. 
the way he treats the way he treats wood in my opinion a mystic has reverence for wood like those old japanese craftsmen who never used a nail why well, you'll see what peter Zumtor uh, does to the poor wood uh, very soon i hope i have here the pictures you see all the structures use the same uh, architectural language to me they are rather uh, unromantic let's put it this way uh, i still think that if our age was not obsessed so obsessed by reason reason and reason again uh, uh, he would not have been so appreciated but uh, it seems uh, you know at our best uh, uh, we still like very much uh, 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 rational or rationalistic uh, configurations architectural configurations not to speak about the the roofing here you know i mean look at the roofing would you use this kind of roofing in a, in the mountains where there is a lot of snow but this is almost a flat roof i'm not a functionalist far from it but i do know that in the in the mountains it's very preferable to have sloping roofs of a significant degree so the snow can roll down from the roof yeah, no problem with this you know he's uh, uh, he's not concerned about this now look at this stone at the rocks look at the 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 huge nails if i am to call them uh, nails i i try to avoid the technical uh, word he's uh, he's uh, actually he's raping the rocks you could say how could you rape a rock but how could you rape wood because he does the same thing you know this is a very in my opinion almost cynical uh, approach to materials you know this uh, this piercing of wood and rock alike with uh, with a uh, uh, you know a metallic uh, uh, you know uh, things that you have at your disposal to me it doesn't show a lot of sensitivity <clears throat> i certainly cannot see here the 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 adoration of the joint the one that uh, uh, Louis Kahn mentioned in relation with the works of uh, uh, Carlos Carpa. There is no adoration of the joint here. There is no joint. That's not how you put together, bring together two entities or two people, let's say, in a marriage, a he and a she. Not in this way. This is very aggressive. That's why I'm, I'm, I continue to be very surprised that this man is considered a mystic. To me, a mystic doesn't want to disturb through will, through willfulness, nature, which is uh, God's creation. But here, I'm very sorry, piercing rocks in this way, um, I find very questionable. Sorry for my sincerity. There are other problems. You look at this structure, and we are, I hope I have a picture from the inside. The window is very low. Uh, it's almost like uh, it's destined to. I hope I'm not wrong. I hope I have pictures here. I hope I. Uh, you can see. Yeah, look here. Uh, it, it's it's almost forcing you to look downwards instead of looking upwards towards. And he had plenty of space because you, as you can see, this is a very tall, uh, very tall structure. And he did it in another place. We are going to see it. Now, of course, it's nothing wrong to look downwards because you see trees and so on. But what about the sky, Mr. Mystic? I mean, the sky does not matter. Uh, it's, I find it awkward, really awkward. In order to see the sky, you almost have to lower yourself and look upwards in, a, in an, un an uncomfortable position. Here, the knees see more than your eyes, the way he designed this. And I don't know very well why he designed it in this way. He could have designed it in many other ways. 
maybe I'm too critical, but this is this is what I feel. This is what I reflected upon. This is what I thought. In my opinion, is not is not a romantic work and it's not a mystical work. It's a it's a work of aggression actually towards a beautiful landscape, and towards wood and towards rocks. And look at him in this po uh, in in this posture. I mean, really, I am I am I am actually paying homage to him now, talking about him and his works on his birthday. And I don't think too many people do this today while we do it. But when I see this picture, you know, I, I'm very sorry. I, 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 I'm not very trustful of this man. He's too self-involved and too, too, uh, too absorbed by his persona. You would say that here is God himself, you know, uh, describing some kind of, uh, you know, mystery of the world in, uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, if this was, uh, let's say an Egyptian pyramid or uh, the Parthenon itself, or, uh, you know, some truly great building, maybe, maybe, but even then I would have objected to this kind of posturing. But what is this? It's a little nonsense, almost of plywood, you know, uh, raping uh, stone and, uh, and uh, wood, and he's, uh, you know, in a way, in front of this little thing, as if, come on, really, I think he's exaggerating. I think he's a great salesperson. I think he knows very well how to sell, and he succeeded. And look here, is this a sign of, of uh, sensitivity? Piercing wood like this? I would have never done it. And uh, the old Japanese who knew how to work with wood would not have done it either. This shows aggressivity. No wonder that this man uh, said that he lost a long time ago the, the belief that architecture can change the world. But in my opinion, if you don't have this belief, why do you continue to build? I don't think, I don't think an architect with a certain sensitivity continues to build without some a little bit of hope at least that he or she can contribute to the betterment of, of, of the human life. In my opinion, all important architects did believe because otherwise, if you don't believe in this, why do you continue to build? I am suspicious of this man. This is the third or fourth presentation I make about uh, Peter Zumthor. And um, I kind of think the same way. I didn't change. Columba Museum in Köln, here again, we'll see a display. There are some good things here. And not everything he does is really uh, bad or uh, you know uh, questionable. Uh, he has uh, he has some talent, but I think he's overrated. Like here, for example, he has he uh, he has this uh, this ruined building, but in my opinion, again, he has great troubles to uh, connect, to bring together, to join. I don't think he, he knows how to join. Uh, look here, uh, here it, you know, this is the old uh, wall and this is the new wall. This is very simplistically done and I think even aesthetically uh, problematic. I think even in, uh, you know, uh, less ambitious schools of thought, you know, it is recommended to have a, a third entity or, or space, some kind of a spacing between this wall and this one. Here, there is no spacing. He is uh, brutally bringing together the old and the new, but this is not joining. This is not the art of joining. Uh, look, at, look at this to me is, is, is um, actually depressing. I mean, is this a resolved window or a configuration of blocking the window? In my opinion, it shows almost cynicism. I, I, when I look at this picture, I, am, I'm, I could envision that behind it is some kind of a, uh, you know, almost concentration camp. Sorry for, uh, for using such harsh words, but to me, I, I, I don't see grace here. I don't see, I don't see sensitivity. I don't feel... I don't feel he had compassion for this old arch and these remnants of the old building. He didn't. Really, if this would have done by another architect, would have been done by another architect, 
I think many, many people would have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, less uh, willing to applaud, but because it was done by him. I mean, look here, you know, is this, is this uh, an inspiring yes towards life, towards art, towards the past? I don't think so. I, I, that's not what I feel. He's pro, I, I could understand he's not very optimistic probably about the human destiny or human affairs, but he built this uh, not during the, the Ukraine war, he built it uh, years ago. Uh, so his pessimism, um, I don't know if it was so justified or justifiable. After all, he is in many ways a very spoiled, you know, uh, in a way, a lucky architect. You know, he, he achieved uh, uh, fame, uh, you know, awards, uh, money, uh, adoration. He has it all. Then, then, then why such, uh, uh, you know, such, uh, why such an aesthetic? This is not the aesthetic of joy, in my opinion. And again, what bothers me is his unwillingness to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, sensitively uh, unite or attempt to unite two entities. Like in this case, like we saw previously also, you know, he's not bringing things together in a subtle way. There is aggressivity here. That's what I see. But he's, um, he's uh, interesting in a way because because paradoxically, uh, I mean, I, I'm not trying to psychoanalyze him now as an amateur psychoanalyst, but I, I have a feeling this man is, is actually not very gentle. And yet uh, he, he was able to promote uh, a persona of, of uh, you know, uh, ample uh, gentleness. I'm not convinced of him. This stare is well done, uh, I think. Uh, uh, but uh, again, there are many architects who can build, uh, you know, uh, convincing uh, staircase. It's not, uh, you know, it's not the beginning and the end of the world. There are some qualities in this space here. I, I like this zigzagging uh, passageway in this space. I do like it, and I hope I have pictures with it. Um, I am not sure about this, uh, this uh, porosity of the walls. The idea is good, perhaps, but the, this uh, pointillism, architectural pointillism is a little bit, um, I don't know, there's something for me seems to be missing. It's still kind of based on, 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 on the reason somehow, although he is appearing to be playful, but the playfulness I think what is missing is roundness. You know, they, you don't you don't have the interplay between the square and the circle, or to talk in in mystical terms, the squaring of the circle. I, I don't see it. Um, I don't see it here. But this is nice. I think this uh, this uh, bridge uh, passageway, and you know, uh, looking at the the ruins, the foundations of the previous building. There are some qualities, but the the columns also, to me, are rather simplistic and uh, frigid, and a little bit commercial too. Peter Zumto. Now the brother Klaus Field Chapel. He built, um, you know, a few chapels like this. This one is very nice inside. It is true. I like it inside very much. This picture in particular, I I, I find it uh, um, inspired and inspiring, and I congratulate him for it. But I don't congratulate him for the for the entrance door uh, in this chapel which I find uh, rather uh, oppressive in its uh, geometrical determinism. The sketch, he makes nice drawings, though. I, I have seen, especially for the Serpentine Gallery uh, pavilion, um, uh, some, some very nice watercolors, but we'll arrive there. But this interest into the chapel, 
I'm sorry, but it's rather closer in spirit to an entrance to a gas chamber. First of all, it's metallic, it's heavy, it's opaque. This is not a welcoming, uh, even the triangle is so astute, you know, it's, yes, the triangle, uh, you know, maybe could be seen also in a positive way, but it's too harsh. It's a harsh triangle and it's a cold, heavy metal door. To me, this is not a door that welcomes you into the house of spiritual light. After all, it is a chapel. I mean, would you imagine this kind of door uh, to a, you know, a church or a cathedral or a chapel done by someone else? This is, it's almost for me, and I am subjective and I apologize if I am considered to be too subjective, but to me, it's almost a cynical architectural door, uh, architectural statement with this heavy, thick, metallic, opaque door. Look at it. It's almost like a gas chamber. It's, I, 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 I really don't think uh, this man is his spirituality is so high as as he pretends as as people think he is. I, I, I am, this is not the triangle of spirit because the triangle of spirit, in my opinion, should be also the triangle of modesty. The triangle is not very modest to begin with, but treated in material terms the way he did it, in my opinion, is uh, deprived almost complete without almost, this is not a modest, as you'd expect, the entrance into a museum. Uh, look, uh, it's, it's uh, <laughs> that's what I feel, that's what I think. Another chapel, now in this chapel, we'll see something else. Uh, this chapel, in, in my opinion, has other problems. Let's hope uh, we arrive at, uh, look at the outside. What do you see here? Well, I'm sure he didn't plan this, did he? Well, the same almost horizontal, almost flat roof. Of course, in the, in the Switzerland, snows a lot. The snow accumulated here and the snow affected this wall. That's it. That he doesn't care too much about wood seems to me obvious. We saw how he penetrated uh, those uh, uh, pieces of wood uh, in, in Norway, we see here that he didn't care that this wood is suffering when the, when the snow, smel uh, the snow uh, melts down and uh, creates this uh, discomfort for wood, if I am to call it so. Look at this stair. Is this the a Pritzker stair? Is this a stair of a master in architecture? I mean, I understand we have minimalism, although he is not quite a minimalist architect. I would say rather he's a careless architect because we have John Poson, for example, a British true minimalist who creates a beautiful, um, you know, stairs. Uh, he was able to, we saw the museum in, 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 in Germany, but here again, this is a chapel, no? It's a, it's a small house of God, it's the house of spirit. This is almost like the stair of, uh, you know, a stair for a banal house going to the basement. It, it, it's a stair, not that it is modest. This is not, this is not modesty. This is indifference or even cynicism. I am very sorry if he was here, I would have told him the same thing. There is cynicism here towards not employing the proper roofing in an area where it snows a lot. And here is another kind of cynicism. And I, 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 I don't find uh, anything spiritual in this building. Plus, plus, you'll see that there was another building almost identical with this one uh, built by other architects um, years ago. Well, we'll arrive at that picture. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you could ask many students of architecture and architects to design a chapel, and probably they would come up with something like this very easily. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I really don't think it's, it's great architecture here. It's, it's 
it's architecture, but when I look at this and I think of some of the great chapels of the world that were built over, over, over the years, including in modernity, this one to me is, if I was a little bit aggressive and I seem to be today, I, I, it, it seems to me almost a joke. I am sorry. And, uh, you know, uh, snow punish it, punishes the, the joke. And uh, the entrance is, uh, again, this is not modesty. This is cynicism. You can be very, very, uh, you know, uh, modest, but with care. Uh, here I see banality. I'm very sorry that, that stair is banal, very banal. Uh, there is some curvature there, it's true. Uh, even these drawings, I don't know if he did these drawings. I hope not because he knows how to draw. Um, these drawings I like, it's true. I don't know if he did them um, or his, I mean, his office, they are finely drawn, but um, I am not, personally, I'm not moved by this building. I, I don't feel God here. I, I, I see God in a, you know, in a, in a sacred space by, uh, uh, you know, Luis Baragan. I think of him now, but here I don't. I, uh, maybe it's my own inability. Maybe I did see it inside that uh, chapel with a triangular door. The inside, yes, there is very, uh, very well uh, achieved. Uh, what is this? Um, yeah, this is the other, I told you, from 1959, a very similar building built by these people, uh, or this person, Rudolf Schwartz. It's larger, but it's larger, but in my opinion, is a superior building to, uh, to the one uh, uh, done by uh, Peter Zumthor. Uh, the, the plan is similar. It's a larger building, of course, but here we see architecture, we don't see jokes. Uh, uh, this is the, the top view uh, of his building. And, uh, you know, here you see even better, you know, the, the, the great achievements, architectural achievements of the Prisker Prize laureate. I, I mean, I don't know, are these people who offer the Prisker Prize blind? I, I really don't know, I don't understand. I have seen uh, uh, very questionable uh, things this year as well, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with Francis Kerr. So again, if I compare this with, uh, with this, uh, is this better than this? Uh, I don't think so. Anyway, it's smaller. You could say, okay, it's a more innocent work, but it's not innocent. Uh, memorial, uh, this one we saw. Um, long, long, long indeed, a long corridor. He likes straight lines, obviously, and he is good when he zigzags a little bit. Uh, we have seen it, but I, I really don't think this is a, an unbelievable work. And again, we see the same uh, game of, uh, of raping the wood in aggressive and uh, so-called efficient way because it's very easy. He doesn't care about joining. Uh, Peter, Peter Zumthor doesn't care about joining. At least here he elevates the wood from the earth, which is a good idea. But the transition through the steel is, look here, is the same aggressivity towards the wood that he performs in Nor perform performed in, 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 in Norway as well. There is some skill, rectangular skill, but a house, now this house, with this house, I really have a problem, maybe more than the other buildings, because I never yet saw a building with shelves for the snow. And that's exactly what uh, Peter Zumthor did here. Look at the beautiful building on the left, the existing old building, and look at what he did on the right, creating for, in my opinion, graphic reasons, superficial reasons actually, certainly not functional, shelves for snow. So uh, why he did them, uh, I don't know. Look at them. Look at this, the multitude of shelves and they are wide. 
they are well, at least, I mean, I didn't measure them, but they seem to be at least 15, 20 centimeters wide in an area where it snows a lot and the rains a lot. If this was done inside to put books on, I would have understood. But to put them outside for no reason at all. Again, there is no reason for this. These are shelves for snow. I never saw shelves for snow before. Uh, well, here he is, but uh, I hope I have other pictures with him because to me, this is outrageous. Uh, it's just outrageous. He, under he understood nothing and considered nothing from the old building. The old building is beautiful and truly modest. This is not modest. And look at this window. So narrow. Again, it's, it's like uh, condemning the one inside to not see the sky. But here is better, yes. But this window is the window of, I'm sorry, a concentration camp. To do something like this in nature, in this beautiful landscape, to me, this is sadistic. This kind of window is sadistic in such a beautiful landscape. I look at it here. You know, it's all, it's the graphism of these parallel lines he wanted totally uselessly. I mean, again, these are shelves for snow and rain. Here he is, the, the master architect. Of course, he works alone. He did all these works by himself, right? Of course, he has an office. Nobody saw pictures of those who helped him. Nobody. It's just him, right? The mystic. But the mystic has a beautiful kitchen, doesn't he? You know, orange juices and all kinds of exotic juices and fruits and vegetables and uh, ice cream, probably. And uh, I mean, you know, I'm tired of this man. Sorry for being so honest. Back to this, um, to the shelves of, for snow. Uh, why this man is a, a hero, I do not understand. I, I really don't understand. Look at them. You can see them clearly. Can you imagine in the winter, the snow will uh, accumulate here without doubt. The rain also in time, this wood would uh, uh, curve itself because the abuse that it receives. And in, in contrast, look at this window, this beautiful small window of the old building. I'm not a passeist. I love the new. I love invention. I love modernity. But this is a fake modernity. This is, to me, this is, this is sheer nonsense to do something like this towards the exterior. I, 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 I cannot comprehend. And look at the window. Again, like in uh, Norway. You know, this is a sadistic window. It truly is. Yeah, no, and he didn't make this uh, window small or narrow because of uh, sustainability reasons. No, because of graphic reasons. Uh, that's why. Look at the old building. I think it's beautiful. Now, it's true. I'm a nostalgic man. I like this picture because it's old. But here I see more wisdom, more modesty, and even more skill of some people who probably didn't have an architect you know, some uh, anonymous people build this building. And this is, this is the shelf, this is the shelf for snow of the Pritzker Laure. Done without any reason, except to accumulate the snow. I, I find it outrageous. No one could explain to me why he did these shelves towards the outside. <laughs> Uh, killing wood for nothing. That's what it is about. Killing wood for nothing. Now we uh, go to Thermal Bass in Bass, this celebrated work by, by him. Uh, in my opinion, this is not so mysterious and magical as people think. And I will, I will, uh, I will uh, legitimate my statement by this simple fact. Most pictures that I saw of this uh, public bus show very sensuous uh, silhouettes, like in this case. Why? Why? Because in most important architecture, you don't need such things because the architecture is warm and uh, you know uh, sometimes mysterious, uh, uh, sometimes uh, interesting, without the need for uh, 
uh, you know, corporeal sensationalism. Uh, you know, look at this. Why did this building need such posturing? Because without this posturing, it's actually, to, to, to use a language I, I very rarely use, if at all, bloody cold. The building is bloody cold. It's rational, it's rationalistic. I'm not against reason. You can achieve mysticism through reason too, through the right angle too. Uh, Le Corbusier wrote a poem, uh, Le Poem de l'Angle Droit. Descartes was in a way a poet and a mystic, but Sumtor is not. This is my opinion. He's not a mystic. He mimics being a mystic. He's not. He's not, and, and if you remove these uh, sensualities from his, you know, many pictures are like this with, uh, you know, uh, seductive uh, silhouettes, exactly because without them, the building is not actually so interesting and it's not mystical, in my opinion. Another problem I have with this building is that, in my opinion, you see, we have glass here, uh, grass, and here we have grass again, but, but this is a building. This is the top of the building. And the way the, the, the grass is domesticated here, uh, to me, it's so uh, geometrically, uh, it's, it's, again, I think it's cold. Uh, I don't know if I am now inspired enough to explain uh, very well what I want to say, but it bothers me that the otherness that the building is supposed to mean here is uh, um, uh, diluted through the, the illusion, uh, uh, you know, mimicking that somehow this is nature too, because we have grass here and we have grass here. But this is not nature because you, you'll never see in nature such a flat surface. So there is, a, in my opinion, there is a, something uh, problematic here. Maybe, maybe I, I uh, intensify something that, uh, should not be seen in, in such, uh, you know, uh, resolute or intense terms, but I think it's a mistake, this one, you know, to mimic nature through the material, but not through the geometry. And it's, 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 um, it's a manipulation of grass, which I find uh, problematic. Not to speak about, I mean, you know, these walls, these walls are cold. I mean, uh, literally and figuratively, they are cold. They are gray. They are, I don't know. I like to think that the public bus could have some worms in, in feeling the atmosphere. After all, what, didn't he publish a book about atmospheres? Well, I don't see so much atmospheres in his work, actually. Only for rationalists and not the, not the true mystics of rationalism, this would appear as being, uh, um, you know, uh, mystical. I like the, the, I hope I have here the, the drawing. Yes, I like very much this drawing, which was done by him. And I, I, I acknowledge the beauty of the drawing, but I think the fogginess, the poetry of the drawing was not uh, properly reflected in the built work. Uh, the built work is more rigid, in my opinion, than, than the drawing. Yes, when the fog uh, comes down, maybe the building softens a little bit its image, but otherwise I, I find it a rather harsh building. Uh, you know, the, 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 the distance between it and, and the landscape outside is the distance between, uh, uh, you know, uh, the shepherd of existence, anthropos, meaning uh, controlling man, a controlling human being, and the nature which is uh, under siege. I like the labyrinthical side of these things. There are some qualities here in terms of the plan, the drawing that uh, we, we just saw, but um, all in all, I, I, find it, uh, I find it a cold, a cold building, uh, a Cartesian building. The, the Cartesian aspect of the building is not shown in the drawing. In the drawing, he evokes something else. Although you can approximate the rectangularities, it's true, but also because of the color, uh, graphical is a good work. I like it. Um, 
again, you know, we see, yes, of course, you can take interesting pictures in almost any building. It doesn't have to be by a master architect. You can. Yes, this one I like too. I like these drawings and I also saw drawings and I'm, I'm going to show them when we arrive at the Serpentine Gallery, uh, Serpentine Pavilion. Uh, he did some good watercolors there too. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, is this facade of this building uh, truly connecting with the context, with the landscape? It's, it's an institutional big building with a lot of, uh, you know, cold, uh, you know, human material, uh, if I am to call it so, huge pieces of glass which do not open. I don't find it very poetical and very, very warm, very inducing to, especially when I see this fragile fence around, in what way does this building connect with the, yeah, with the, with the, with nature, with the grass, with this fence, with I don't see it doing it. It's it's too it's too massive and too gray, and too sure of, of itself. I think it's still a building of a domineering human being. That's how I see it. It's a building of a domineering human being, and I have problem with that. Now the Serpentine Gallery, I have problems with this one too, sorry for being negative. And I will explain why. I think he did a nice thing here, inviting a landscape architect to create this uh, narrow and long, we know he's liking for long things and na rather narrow uh, garden. Nice. Nature should be admired from these chairs and tables. But what is less nice is that this, well, the watercolor is very nice. And again, I acknowledge what is to be acknowledged. As a graphic work, it's very, very good. I like it. But what I don't like is that this building orients every viewer towards the inside and doesn't care at all about the outside, which is also nature, because it's a park. So, you know, if outsider were highways, or some disturbing, uh, you know, urban, uh, uh, you know, uh, scenes or whatever, I would have understood. This was a refuge. You turn inwardly and you admire the beauty and the richness of nature. I would have understood completely. But this pavilion is placed in a park, also with nature. Look at these trees. The building by Peter Zumthor turns its back towards these trees. These poor trees, I, 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 I fantasize now, they are crying that the building by Peter Zumthor turn, turns its back on them and honors only this island of, uh, of nature, uh, so-called wild, uh, that uh, he created at the center. Beautiful up the plants, beautiful is the green, beautiful are the leaves that, you know, this is beautiful, but he orients the building so misanthropically towards the outside. And look, look at, the, look at the, look at the, the access into the building. Again, this this ungraceful way of, of 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 employing concrete asphalt to lead. I mean, this is in a park. Well, if we contemplate. Um, you know, Katsura Palace, or we contemplate the gardens in China or Japan or other parts of the world, those ancient, um, you know, gardeners would, would have never done something so brutal. Without any respect for earth, for grass, it's just, just pouring asphalt to lead to the uh, to the dark chamber. And look, he did it again. It's like, it's like, you know, entering into a garage or something. If this was wide enough, you could have thought it. Uh, yes, this was made for cars. Well, he could have, if, he, if this man loves nature as he should, if he loved this land and the uh, grass and so on, uh, he would not have made such a, 
you know, uh, really uh, abrasive uh, surfaces of, 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 of concrete leading into this, uh, you know, two or here three uh, black holes into a, I mean, even this wall, is this wall honoring the beauty of the trees outside? Is this the facade of a building that says yes to the park? No. In fact, here we could have had another gas chamber. This is my opinion. It's a building without any kind of sensitivity towards, towards the park around it. I don't understand these people who offer the Pritzker Prize are blind. I mean, is this a graceful building? He's protecting the garden within almost religiously, but he doesn't give a damn, sorry for the vulgarity of the expression, for the nature outside of the building, which is also a park. I mean, are these trees inferior to the plants inside the building in the courtyard? I don't think so. Don't they both belong to, the, to nature? Don't they both belong to, in a way, the creator? No, if, if uh, Frank Lloyd White was correct that uh, when he was asked, do you believe in, uh, in, in God? And he said, I do, but I spell it nature. In my opinion, Peter Zumthor doesn't see a relationship between God and nature. No, he's sadic, he's sadic, he's sadic towards the park. Again, you know, he, he, uh, if, this, if there was a big highway here and, uh, you know, industrial buildings or, or whatever, I would have understood. You turn your back on them because they are unpleasant and polluting and so on and turn the attention and the affection for the inside because that's where the, that's where the flowers are. But the flowers are also outside and he's not honoring in any way. In fact, he's totally indifferent towards the outside. I, to me, this is a very disappointing uh, uh, structure he built. Yes, these flowers are beautiful, but he didn't make the flowers. He did make the watercolors, which I like, but I don't like the building. Again, I find it very arrogant. Everybody here is looking towards these beautiful plants and they deserve to be admired and have affection for them. They do, but so do the, the, the trees and the flowers outside and the grass. That's also nature, is it not? I mean, is it so, look, here, here we have the bonanza of nature, uh, the, the way it is represented here. Well, this is the plan which probably his landscape architect drew, you know, a, a lot of horticulture here. And I'm glad, uh, you know, he did a good job. I, I, I admire what I see here, of course, but I don't admire the architect for turning his back on, on the park. No, no. And you see, well, this is less skillfully done. I, I, I almost hope that it wasn't him who did it, but I'm tired of these gray, black buildings when, when, when you actually build in a park. You know, here at least we see the, you know, the, the imagined nature in the center, but you can see in the section that, you know, the sloping roof is all oriented towards the inside and towards the outside, you have almost a fortress, a black fortress, uh, uh, which says no to the park. And uh, this triangle to me is also not, in my opinion, is a little bit too harsh. It might function, but I find it a little harsh. This, uh, this, um, this angle here, it's, it's, it's not gentle. He's, I don't think he's a gentleman, uh, I, no. Uh, yes, you can take beautiful pictures, uh, as I said, of almost any building, any interior. Uh, but what do we see here? The poor uh, shadow of the tree that he turned his back on. The tree is still generous to ornate, to ornament the, the blank, blank and blank again, the, the totally lacking sensitivity elevation of his pavilion with a reflection. So the tree is more generous than he was. The tree is, uh, 
you know, embracing in a way the, the, the ugly building because it is ugly towards the outside. Uh, and uh, yes, we, we can take such pictures. Uh, but inside, again, we are like in, uh, you know, going to the gas chamber. This is, to me, this is not an interior that, um, uh, you know, advocates, uh, uh, you know, kindness and, uh, uh, you know, uh, modesty and warmth. No, but the flowers, yes, they are magnificent. But I'm afraid this man doesn't, uh, I don't know. If his architecture was as beautiful as these plants and these flowers, I, I would have been the first one to, to say it. Uh, look at him here, the mystic. Look at the paparazzi on the left. The man loves it. In my opinion, a true mystic is more discreet. This man cultivates an, a, a persona which is, uh, in my opinion, uh, not authentical. He loves publicity, but you see it here. He loves being godlike, but he is not God. And, and uh, if he was God, he would have had compassion and affection for the trees and grass and the flowers outside of his enclosure. And uh, he doesn't, doesn't care about this. This man loves publicity and the true mystic doesn't. Now, of course, we all like to be acknowledged, but when I look at this asphalt, concrete, uh, harsh surface on this earth, which he built at his instructions, I have great doubts about uh, the subtleties of this great mystic of architecture. Great doubts. The black lily, and we are approaching the end. Now we see another building. Uh, hopefully, they are not going to build it in Los Angeles. Uh, why is it black? This was supposed to be a, a, an art museum, but look what he proposed. And fortunately, there were, there were protests in Los Angeles and, uh, well, I think he changed something, but uh, it's possible it's not going to be built. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art. I have seen this fragment, a fragment of uh, scale, huge scale, at the Venice Biennial a few years ago. And uh, I don't know why it was there because it was supposed to be the Biennial of the Poor that was uh, curated by Aravena. Well, he was, he was invited then. He brought, you can imagine with what incredible expenditures, a huge model, a fragment of his museum as if it was a, a celestial building. Well, we are going to see very soon what this so-called celestial building look like. First of all, why black? He meant, he, he, he meant it to be a huge horizontal building black. Um, I, will, I, I hope I, I accelerate a, a little bit because I want you to look, look at the students or I don't know, young architects, maybe they are part of his office, I don't know. Um, some people working on this model. Um, huge and black for Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, and then we, we go to, to renderings of his, uh, of his uh, work, because this was not built. This is just a project that, that he did uh, that you know, was supposed to be uh, you know, a huge building built in the States. Well, what do we see here? You know, typical museum scenes, a lot of glass, of course, you know, we see Buddhas and all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, meditative postures, and then we see elegant ladies, and then we see, uh, uh, you know, activity, and we see shopping bags, of course, this is the, this is the, the rendering of the office of the mystic, you know, it's, I don't know, I, I, I have doubts about this man, it's true. Uh, here he drew in the, in, in, in you know, uh, reversing the, 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 the uh, chromatics, you know, he made all the buildings around his building uh, black and his building white, when in fact it's the very opposite. Uh, he even called it the black lily. Uh, I don't trust this man. It's true. Now it's very possible. I don't know. Maybe there is something of myself that I see reflected back to me from him because uh, Carl Jung said that when we criticize harshly something or someone outside of ourselves, it's because we see 
something that we are not happy with from within reflected back to us from the one that we criticize so i have to be careful uh, maybe some of the of the my characterizations about him could apply to me too i hope not but i want to be i want to be sincere and uh, acknowledge such a uh, such a, an unfortunate possibility i hope i hope not i have seen as i said a huge fragment of this uh, building uh, at the venice biennial hidden behind a row of clothes uh, done by uh, i don't know actually what they were doing there uh, by uh, i think a south korean uh, uh, designer and i never understood reflecting backwards why that that thing was brought to the venice biennial in that year because it had nothing to do with the theme of the biennial which was building for the poor it was the 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 poor's biennial but because he is famous he was invited because this is the procedure you know if you have fame you are invited it doesn't matter what the theme is and of course you don't do a new project so you bring in from uh, overseas with uh, or from wherever you be you, you bring it from switzerland with immense expenditures uh, to the to venice look at this would you call this a graceful work i i wouldn't i mean even at this schematic level of a model i i i wouldn't hello mr uh, peter Zumthor. maybe i was too harsh to him i'm beginning to have a little bit of a little bit of sorrow but i and you see he was able he is able to draw and to watercolor and so on but this sketch that he did to me is showing either a rush or a certain disregard both for the museum he was intending to build maybe he hates los angeles it's possible because i think this man is is um, is capable of uh, adverse uh, feelings uh, yeah we arrive at what i just said and with this i think i end the venice biennial in 2006 16 uh, and and that's a fragment of his uh, big uh, model for uh, los angeles and i told you it was hidden it was hard to see and it was actually in reality a little bit darker than we see in the picture I don't know exactly what the meaning of this clothes was, but uh, he didn't do this. This belonged to someone else, a designer. But this thing, huge thing, you can imagine how much is being spent to bring this. You see the scale, you see here the steps. I mean, this is, you can go inside. It's like a, like a house bringing it to Venice. It's, you know, the, the expenditures are colossal. Was it worth it? In my opinion, no, it was not. And then we complain that the resources of the, of the world are depleting. Well, that's why, because we have all kind, we do all kinds of uh, foolish, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, gestures and expenditures that are really contributing uh, to nothing. Uh, what can we do? The mystic. Uh, is uh, married here to you know to fashion and. Uh, Together they create uh, the the black lily of Los Angeles, which was not going to be built. It's not going to be built, I think. But this was, uh, you know, from uh, at least uh, six, seven years ago. I don't know what happened to this project in the meantime. The inside, of course, you know, typical museum uh, artworks on the walls, uh, Lux Calme Volupte, shopping bags, you know, before the pandemic. What can we say? Life can be beautiful, although the walls are gray, gray, and in my opinion, um, rather depressing. And now we go to a very different uh, architect, in fact, a gardener of genius. I think Olmsted had it, uh, a truly great landscape architect. Uh, and um, I wish uh, architects would learn from someone like him because uh, this man who uh, didn't study landscape architecture uh, was able to build some significant parks. Uh, I mean, the word significant is probably not so well chosen. Frederick Law Olmsted, born in 1822 and he died in 1903. 
so father of, of American landscape architecture. Uh, and, uh, and he was. So let's read a little bit about him. So he was born like uh, the other two architects, I M. Pei and Peter Zumthor, on April 26, but in 1822, was an American landscape architect, journalist, social critic, and public administrator. He was the father of American landscape architecture. Olmsted was famous for co-designing many well-known urban parks with his senior par partner, Calvert Vaux, a Frenchman. One of Olmsted's early works included designing the Walnut Hill Park in New Britain, Connecticut. His later efforts included Central Park and Prospect Park in New York City and uh, Cad Wallader Park in Trenton. He headed the preeminent landscape architecture and planning consul consultancy of late 19th century America, which was carried on and expanded by his sons, Frederick Jr. and John C. under the name Olmsted Brothers. Daniel Burnham, Burnham uh, force in architecture in Chicago said of him, he paints with lakes and wooded, wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountain sides and ocean views. A nice description. So he was the man and uh, I think his expression also shows uh, shows uh, depth and uh, sensitivity and seriousness. Now, of course, it's easy to idealize the past, but you know these photographs do say something. Uh, Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, some drawings by him. Um, so he designed uh, great, uh, great parks, and I know two of them very well because I had spent a lot of time, maybe too much time in them, the Central Park in Manhattan and Prospect, Prospect Park in, in Brook, Brooklyn, New York. Um, he had a, a, a very, very, uh, he was the right man for the right job. What else can we say? Um, you know, I mean, look, look at these parts and compare them Compare them with the simplicity and even vulgarity of the of the the asphalted uh, uh, passageways or paths that uh, uh, you know Peter Zumthor designed also in a park. You can't. This was a sensitive man who worked with plants. He was a landscape architect, although I think he never studied <clears throat> landscape architecture except by himself. But you can tell from the the drawing of the circulation that, that he was sensitive, that there is a, you know, the, 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 uh, you can tell immediately that th this was a man who indeed painted with a natural, uh, um, you know, uh, I cannot call them materials, or I could you understand as Daniel Burnham said, with mountains and lakes and rivers and, and, and grass and so on. A great architect. Look here, Prospect Park in Brooklyn. Look at the design of the of, of, of the this man, this man, the, this man would not have done what Peter Zumthor did. No, now it's true he didn't leave at the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st. I think without idealizing the past, I think we are more cynical. We don't even notice the lack of sensitivity any longer. But it's enough to contemplate the, 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 the plan, the, you know, the plan of this park that he designed to feel that this was a man who uh, was a philosopher of, of, uh, of uh, maybe a reader of Emerson, uh, you know, a, a man who understood nature, uh, something I am sorry, I cannot truly really say about Peter Zumthor. It's true, Peter Zumthor is not a landscape architect. Um, but uh, I don't know what is here. He didn't design, he, he made also some designs for Washington, where of course, uh, symmetries and uh, the ceremonial of uh, governmental uh, procedures had to be respected, but the buildings were not done by him. We begin now with Central Park in New York City, a truly great park, and Manhattan is lucky to have it. In 1857, a rising young architect from London 
he was from London, but uh, from uh, uh, French, uh, uh, you know, uh, roots, uh, Calvervo asked Olmsted to join him in pre preparing an entry for the Central Park com competition. I think, uh, uh, if I remember well, um, uh, Olmsted worked for the administration of parks. He didn't have training uh, in, uh, in architecture or landscape architecture, but he was involved, very involved. You see, it says here, at that time, Olmsted was serving as the first superintendent of Central Park, a position that Vo assumed would give Olmsted unique knowledge of the topography. Olmsted had never submitted a design for a public park before, but their submission, known as the Green's World Plan, was exceptional in its creativity and beauty, says this person, Petri. Like so many of us do, Olmsted and Vo worked up to the very last second to submit the design. The Frederick Law Olmsted papers know that when they arrived to submit the, their plan for the competition, the offices were closed and they had to rouse the janitor and leave the, their submission with him. We know this, we know how hard it is to work for a competition and indeed always uh, time is a problem. And if, if you finalize the work is in the last second, as it turns out, the presentation was inspired. It included before and after views that allow the commissioners to envision what the park would look like after Olmsted and Vo had completed their work. There were to be passages of open space as well as more rugged terrain, says this person, anticipating that New York City would one day be a large metropolis, both Vo and Olmsted planned to have heavy planting around the edges of the park to exclude the sights and sounds of the future city and to provide visitors a restorative and peaceful place. Uh, again, if we compare this to the um, uh, pavilion done by uh, um, Peter Zumthor in London, he there, he didn't have this problem because uh, outside of his pavilion was nature. In this case, well, a very different case, of course, but in this case, you would understand why Vo and Olmsted planted, uh, you know, big trees at the edges because you had, uh, you know, highways and big avenues and boulevards around it. It's a, it's a, it's a magical park, you know, and uh, it's truly a, a great, uh, great richness for, uh, for um, New York City. He is, here is the Metropolitan Museum of Art and um, anyway, Columbia University with its School of Architecture and not only, of course, is somewhere here. This is the, um, you know, Central Park West. John Lennon was killed in front of his house. He, he lives somewhere here in a very famous uh, residence, a building at 72nd Street or something, if I remember well. Anyway, this is, uh, I mean, these are, you know, the rich, the rich live here on the East, richer than the West, but even on the West, there are, you know, uh, the proletarians do not, uh, do not live here. Um, okay, so moving forward. Um, these are, these are pictures of the, you know, it's a very rich and visceral park. Uh, and uh, I think very, very gracefully are done the circulations. There is circulation for the, the automobiles as well. Um, but uh, you see, it's curved. It's not, and it's not simplistically curved. It's, it's, it, they are almost like the veins within one's body. It's, they, they are organic. Central Park, Olmsted and Vo, but Olmsted was uh, was the actual, uh, you know, uh, landscape designer. And what can I say? You know, the magic of nature is the magic of nature. And uh, if you understand it and feel for it, uh, it shows. If you don't, well, you don't, I guess. Uh, Central Park, Central Park. Um, uh, this is a picture, a recent picture. You see those two girls have uh, masks. 
So it's after 2020, uh, after the pandemic started. His, his landscape design is very sensitive and romantic in a way, you know, and uh, I, I appreciate it very much. Now, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, also designed by him, designed by Olmsted and Calvergo in the mid 19th century. This uh, green space first opened to the public in 1867 when it was only partially built and was later designated a scenic landmark by the City Landmarks Preservation Commission in 1975. Today, Prospect Park, nicknamed Brooklyn's, Brooklyn's Backyard, welcomes more than 10 million visitors each year to enjoy concerts at its band shell, a zoo, children's playground equipment, pedal boats on the picturesque lake and miles of roads for joggers, walkers and cyclists. It's a great example of the landscape architect's pastoral style. This was the word I was trying to find. Yes, his uh, landscape uh, design is, is um, you know, uh, described with this word pastoral, which can be seen in the marvelous 75 acre a long meadow. It is open green space, says Petri, with small bodies of water and scattered trees and groves designed to be soothing to the eye and to be restorative in spirit. Uh, and here is the plan. We already uh, took a look at, at this. I, I, I love this plan. I mean, even as a graphic work, I, I, I think it's, 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 it's beautiful. Uh, and uh, yes. Uh, glory to glory to Olmsted. I have been here. I, I laid on that grass. It's nice, and uh, indeed, uh, many people uh, enjoy it very much, as you can see. But parks in general are, are nice, you know. And uh, why? Because there is nature, and of course, in this picture, we contemplate a spring day, and spring is always beautiful, as it is now outside as well. Prospect Park. There are also all kinds of bridges, and uh, it, it's a complex, uh, you know, uh, network of, of alleys and the roads and so on. Now another park in Boston, uh, Boston Emerald Necklace. Uh, the this uh, winding uh, uh, network of green spaces stretching across the city of Boston consists of the Arnold Arboretum, Franklin Park, and Back Bay Fans, the verdant expanses, which referred to as one of the necklace jewels, feels like its own distinctive and natural landscape. And that's on purpose. Olmsted's vision of city parks uh, being sanctuaries from the clamor and greed of urban life is played out. So again, this is important to, to, to underline. Olmsted understood city parks as sanctuaries away from the clamor and greed of urban life. It's played out as you travel through these seven mile long uh, series of meadows, marshlands and roadways. When Olmsted successfully applied this design theory to New York City Central Park, Boston took note and eventually hired him in the 1870s to build not just one large park, but an entire park system where Bostonians could easily go when the day's work is done and where they may stroll for an hour, seeing, hearing, and feeling nothing of the bustle and jar of the streets. By 1895, after about 20 years of work, Olmsted was finished. He went on to settle in Brookline in 1883, opening offices for the countries first landscape architecture firm in his home and continuing to work on the city's chain of parks. Uh, he had a very, very, very rich activity. He designed many parks. So nature, parks, people sitting down, talking, uh, colors, uh, the green, the smell of nature. It's beautiful. Nature is always beautiful. And I, I always, I, I, I particularly think now we need more, more gardens and more parks and more green than buildings. Sorry to say this to architects, but um, I think this is the truth. We need more oxygen than that brutal asphalt of Mr. Peter Zuntor. Uh, 
And there was just a small, uh, you know, sample of uh, brutality. Of course, there are much uh, larger ones. Uh, what can we say? What would we do without nature? Well, Biltmore Estate in North Carolina, Asheville. Um, I don't know if I, I did well incorporating this text. Uh, you are probably a little tired and I am too. The three mile approach road stretching from Biltmore Village to Biltmore House in Asheville is no accident. It's the result of a very intentional and complex design by Olmsted that showcases a perfect blend of forest and landscape with no hard edges. No hard edges, me, me, Mr. Uh, Peter Zumtor, um, to separate the two and an inten intentional lack of long range views, explains this person. Anyway, um, let's move forward. He, he used native plant materials as the basis for his plan, adding 10,000 rhododendrons uh, as a background element for the road. He also used mountain laurels, native and Japanese andromeda and other plants evergreens in the foreground at richness, delicacy and mystery. Delicacy, Mr. Peter Zumtor, you have them in the watercolors, you have it in the watercolors and uh, the pencil drawing sometimes, but not in the buildings. While varieties of river came, uh, cane and bamboo offer a hint of the exotic and tropical. He placed low growing plants along the brook and edge of the drive. For variety of color in the winter, he used hardy, hardy olives, evergreens with an olive tint, junipers, red cedars, and yews, all to create the complexity of light and shadow that define a picturesque style. Well, the light and shadow we know about too from Le Corbusier, but not about nature. Anyway, it's a big uh, palace here. I was surprised. I knew nothing about it. It's, a, it's an incredible residence. Um, America has such buildings, you know, uh, uh, look at it, you know, <laughs> you would say, well, it's not Versailles, of course, but uh, nor is it, nor was it built for a king or an emperor, but the very rich built uh, things inspired from uh, France often, uh, and from even from the Middle Ages uh, in uh, significant ways. So that this doesn't quite look like the brave new world, does it? Um, anyway, uh, look, I mean, here, this is kind of a French garden, you know, the, the, the kind of, um, you know, uh, the French landscape is, uh, is full of, and uh, yes, it's, 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 a, it's a nice landscape, but uh, different from what we see Central Park and Prospect Park. And the building, what can we say? One can only desire to live there. Now, Mount Royal in Montreal, we are approaching the end uh, in Canada. Uh, begun in 1874. I think this is a work which was not finalized. Something happened to it. It was the first park Olmsted designed after he and Bo dissolved their partnership. So they split. In an effort to emphasize the area's mountainous topography, Olmsted decided to make the mountain more mountainous through the use of exaggerated vegetation, such as shed trees, shade trees at the bottom, of the carriage path that climbs the mountain so it would resemble a valley. The vegetation would get sparser as the visitor went higher and higher, completing the illusion of exaggerated height. Olmsted wanted to install a great grand, grand mountain pasture and lake, but the city decided on a reservoir instead. So Olmsted planned a grand promenade around it. Unfortunately, the city of Montreal suffered a depression in the mid 80s, 1870s, and many of Olmsted's plans were abandoned. Uh, the carriageway was built, but it was done hastily and without regard to the original plan. Anyway, let's uh, let's uh, let's move uh, let's move forward to see some pictures. Um, was okay. Uh, nothing really new, but the, but the but the park seems to be a little bit. Um, less accomplished than uh, Prospect Park and, uh, and, um, and uh, Central Park. So this is in, in, in Montreal, in Canada. Still Frederick Law uh, Olmsted. 
of the grounds of the United States Capitol and the White House, a different kind of uh, landscaping for nearly 20 years. Olmsted oversaw the development of the Capitol grounds. In 1874, Congress commissioned Olmsted to plan and oversee landscape improvements. It was Olmsted who gave the Capitol grounds dignified formality to heighten the Capitol's architectural beauty. Uh, Olmsted, Ol Olmsted's original design called for a ground plan that would unite the White House, the Capitol, and other government agencies to symbolize the union of the nation. He scaled back his grand ground plans, however, being permitted to develop only 50 acres, then comprising the Capitol grounds. Uh, unable to create a park amid the Capitol surroundings due to the 21 streets touching the grounds, he instead designed a picturesque scene that emphasized the Capitol's beauty in places where the entire building could be seen. Olmsted was paid only $1,500 for his original design of the grounds. I don't know why this is mentioned. He also was allotted money for travel expenses, salaries for his hired hands, and a sizable 200,000 budget for improvements for the Capitol grounds. During his 18 years as a landscape architect of the Capitol, Olmsted worked to create a scene where the architectural triumph of the capital, I, I wouldn't really call it so, would be emphasized, while the natural beauty of the grounds would offer comfort and solace um, to visitors and city goers. They would not supersede the capital's views and sight lines. Anyway, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, architectural is a triumph, but uh, anyway, uh, for more conventional minds, probably it is. He worked with the, with the trees and the plants and the, the grass and the lawn and so on. Anyway, a difficult uh, job now because how do you marry nature with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the central power of such a you know, giant uh, bureaucracy and uh, yes, power. Washington Park, Chicago. Um, I like this because I don't know if I have here pictures in colors, yes. I, I, I do like the pastoral, uh, maybe I'm sentimental, but I like the pastoral style of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, you know, because how else could you be with plants, you know, which are so fragile and delicate, you know, with flowers, with trees, with bushes. And yes, you, 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 you feel closer to nature if, if the style, as it is called, is pastoral. Not that there is no beauty in André Le Notre. There is, of course, without doubt. I love André Le Notre, but that's a very different kind of approach to uh, gardening and, and, and nature. But this one I like as well. And I think any sensitive person would, uh, would feel uh, pleased to, to walk here. You see, uh, just a second. If I compare the brutality, because I cannot use another word, of, the, of that... Um, a path done in concrete in a park, again, inside the park by, by uh, uh, Peter Zumthor, with what Olmsted did here, we see two different kind of people. This was a sensitive man. You know, uh, truly, I, I am almost angry when I think about the lack of sensitivity of an architect who sh should have known better, you know? Uh, that, that concrete surface uh, so simplistically also um, designed or drawn. Here we see a uh, consideration for, for, for nature and here is not concrete. This is another thing. You don't pour concrete and asphalt so insensitively in a park. You just don't do it, Mr. Zumthor. Anyway, I'm, I don't understand the world I, I live in. I really, sometimes I don't understand. Imagine having here Peter Zumthor, you know, just pouring asphalt and concrete here and killing the, you know, the, the, the generosity of nature and uh, destroying actually the beauty of the park. This is beautiful. I'm sorry, no one can convince me otherwise. It is beautiful because this man understood nature. The World's Colum Columbian Exhibition from 1890, 1893 in Chicago. Uh, Daniel Burnham, I think, was in charge of this, uh, uh, you know, huge uh, 
um, world exhibition. There were some, uh, um, you know, uh, buildings here. I think even Sullivan contributed uh, reading the, the landscaping. Unfortunately, all of this is gone because this is what human beings uh, consider to squatter, uh, you know, uh, their efforts. You know, they squander them to to. Just uh, imagine how much they invested, and the most uh, world uh, exhibitions end up in, uh, you know, being removed, being destroyed, being uh, whatever. The World's Fair in Chicago, 1893. Um, again, he did the landscaping. Now, maybe some of these buildings. Uh, you know, didn't deserve too much to be kept. I don't know. I shouldn't be harsh. Um, hello, Mr. Romstead. Happy birthday to you. That's it. And happy birthday to all three of them. Thank you for being here today.